Can I say what a thrill it is to be at what I believe is the first ever conference anywhere on self-domestication? Something that I'm sure we're going to hear much more about in the future. <clears throat> and, and, and many thanks to everybody for organizing it. So my job is to persuade you, contrary to what Dr. Okonoya thinks, that uh, actually chimpanzees can be uh, somewhat informative about <coughs> <laughs> this process and that we're not all basically just birds. <laughs> so the answer to the question is, yeah, I think so. I think we did. And uh, what I want to do is to avoid just giving lots of data, because lots of data has already been given by all these fantastic talks before. So I want to try and give a, a sort of a conceptual scheme. And the scheme relies on thinking about the parallel between what's happened in uh, the closest apes to ourselves, bonobos and chimpanzees, and comparing that with humans. So self-domestication, we've heard actually one or two different definitions. I think uh, most of us think that domestication is really focused on the question of the reduction of aggression, the increase of tameness. So here is the definition that I'm using, the evolution of a reduced propensity for specifically reactive aggression, losing your temper, jumping when somebody thre threatens you. Um, and uh, obviously it's self-domestication because it's without any other species uh, being involved. So the example here is that uh, a bonobo, which we'll talk about being a very unaggressive animal, uh, would have evolved from a common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans, and uh, that would be a process of self-domestication. Now, the context I want to think about here is not just focusing on bonobos and chimps, but giving the sense that self-domestication, uh, uh, though it is unrecognized as a principal evolutionary dynamic, should be thought of as something that is very widespread because the average species would have had ancestors that were more aggressive than it, as often as it would have had species that were less aggressive than it. So we've had increases in aggression, we've had reductions in aggression, and steady state of evolution, they should be roughly equal. Why would you get reductions in aggression? Well, here are some examples. So uh, if you have uh, smaller groups of, uh, of animals, then you tend to get uh, less uh, intense aggression by the males fighting over possession of the uh, mating rights. Um, on islands, you find that uh, there is evidence that rodents, birds, and actually reptiles uh, all tend to be less aggressive than their immediate counterparts on the mainlands. You sometimes get um, low energy habitats associated with reductions in aggression. There are going to be all sorts of reasons, different in different cases, why aggression is reduced, but it would be a common phenomenon. And the reason that's fascinating is that when we think about the fact of domestication in the animals that we think of as characteristically reduced in aggression, then as we have been hearing, we have a domestication syndrome. So consistently, not always predictable exactly what happens in each animal. There is some variation which is confusing, but nevertheless, there is a consistent pattern. And as we know, much of it is unselected because that's what the wonderful experiments in Siberia have shown us. You select on tameness, you get all these other funny things happening as well. Okay, so that means that when we select against aggression, we produce the domestication syndrome, and uh, Tecumseh-Fitch has uh, given an argument for uh, what it is that is responsible for that. But the key thing I want to draw attention to here is that we have both the selected traits and the unselected traits. So what about in wild animals? We got all these reasons for reducing aggression in wild animals. Shouldn't we again see, since we see such a consistent pattern in, in uh, the ones domesticated by humans, shouldn't we see the same combination of selected traits and unselected traits emerging? All right, so I want to uh, uh, then turn to uh, the bonobo and, uh, and think about the relationship between bonobos and chimpanzees. So these are our two closest relatives. Uh, they separated from each other something it's thought around uh, 900,000 years ago, but I'm sure these estimates will change a little bit over time. And uh, it is absolutely clear from every direction that you look at that there is enormously less aggression in bonobos than there is in chimpanzees. The way to actually get the most reliable information about that is to talk to somebody who is responsible for keeping bonobos or chimpanzees in captivity because you do not take risks with chimpanzees that you do with bonobos. You can allow two groups of bonobos to meld together and uh, be pretty comfortable that they're going to be just fine with each other. That is not the case when you allow chimps together. 
uh, with, whether you're looking within groups or between groups, uh, whether you're looking at uh, dominance uh, status competition or actual killing, um, whether you're looking captivity or the wild, males or females, uh, you always get much more aggression in chimpanzees. And that's very striking because these two species uh, live in forests very similar to each other. They uh, are about the same body weight as each other. Uh, they're in many ways extremely similar. But there is less aggressive anatomy in bonobos, so it makes sense that uh, what we see is a psychological difference, manifest even in captivity, uh, should be reflected in other aspects of their biology. Um, and uh, this is not only in, in the shorter canines, but uh, also in feminization that very much echoes the kind of things that Bob Franciscus was talking about. And I think somebody also mentioned the fact that there's uh, now some preliminary analyses of bonobo brains showing uh, changes uh, from uh, chimpanzee brains, differences from chimpanzee brains consistent with the reduced aggressiveness that they show. Now, what is fascinating about this is that we can look at the cranial anatomy of the bonobo and see something that is immediately reminiscent of what we see in domesticated animals because uh, we see a, a small brain, a, a small cranium, we see a shorter face, a reduced face, and uh, reduced teeth. And uh, if you look at all of the living hominoids, then uh, these are the only species in which we find this. So we don't find it in chimpanzees, gorillas, or orangutans, and nor do we see it in parallel ways in the Australopiths. So that suggests that this is derived from the pattern in hominoids. That suggests that what we're seeing in terms of the cranial anatomy is an evolutionary novelty with bonobos, and since the anatomy is so characteristically associated with reduced aggression in domesticated animals, that also suggests that the reduced aggression is evolutionarily derived in bonobos from uh, what I think we can uh, very confidently call a chimpanzee-like ancestor. So do we have a self-domestication syndrome in bonobos? Absolutely. We've got what appear to be the selected traits, the reduction in aggression, and then we also have these various unselected traits, the reduction in brain size, the uh, reduction in the face and the teeth. You see these uh, views from above of a chimpanzee skull uh, atop and the bonobo skull below. So these are really striking uh, relationships. So it means that you can have the following equation. Wolf is to dog as chimpanzee is to bonobo. And then there's a whole bunch of other traits that uh, Brian Hare and Tori Wabber and I have been systematically reviewing, and uh, in Tori's case, going out and looking for new information about, predicting that uh, just as we see pedomorphic behavior in uh, domesticated animals, so we see it in the bonobos, and indeed we do. Uh, in bonobos, you see uh, the young ones spending more time close to their mothers at later ages, whether in captivity or in the wild, later offspring independence. Uh, in experiments, uh, they are more tolerant with each other uh, at later ages than they are in chimpanzees. There is significantly more play among the adults in bonobos than there is in chimpanzees. And uh, provocatively, um, the bonobos show a lot of homosexuality among adults, which is now uh, being co-opted into functional um, behavior. Homosexuality is quite likely, I think, a pedomorphic behavior, because in young primates, what you see is individuals uh, bouncing on um, both sexes, uh, bouncing both sexes very happily, and then they crystallize at uh, adolescence and uh, become uh, interested only in heterosexuality. So that looks like a pedomorphic trait as well. Uh, there are other traits, uh, like the white tail tuft, um, which is, occurs in, in young chimpanzees and extended in, in later periods of uh, bonobos. And, um, and Tori Waba showed very nicely with experiments that uh, if you look at the development of various cognitive traits, such as the ability to inhibit a response that has been learned in order to um, adapt to a new context, then uh, bonobos are, uh, take longer to uh, uh, learn to uh, inhibit. Oh, the pink lips is a fun one too because uh, I think this could conform to the notion that um, neural crest cells are moving more slowly and uh, not reaching the, the tips of the body in time to produce the melanocytes that will give the, the black color, as um, Tecumseh was saying. Okay, so I think we can talk about uh, bonobos as a test case 
of the self-domestication uh, syndrome idea. Uh, that um, there is uh, no other good explanation, much as we find with the domesticated species uh, for many of these unselected traits are, are not associated with aggression. Uh, and uh, the fact that they are so parallel to what we see in domesticated animals suggests that we have the same sort of mechanism producing uh, this, this weird concatenation of, uh, of traits. I just want to just briefly mention uh, another case because it just is so fascinating to me, um, the red colobus. Um, I work in Uganda a lot, and uh, on the right you see uh, the, the mainland form of red colobus monkey, uh, Procolobus uh, tephroscoles. Um, in Zanzibar, an island off the East African coast and off Tanzania, uh, you have the Zanzibar uh, red colobus, um, and that's been separated for uh, uh, more than half a million years by current genetic estimates. And uh, as uh, often happens on islands, uh, you get hints of, of pedomorphism, you know, there's pedomorphic coloring. Look at this. The baby of the mainland colobus has pink around the lips in just the same way as occurs in the adult of uh, the Zan Zanzibar island form. And uh, it turns out that uh, much as you might expect, if they're following a self-domestication syndrome, there's reduced sexual dimorphism in body mass. Uh, the males are smaller. It's not the females are larger. And uh, the cranial traits are pedomorphic. And uh, here's the most amazing thing. This has not been broadly published, but Tom Strusaker has taken films of it, and it's advertised when you go to the National Park there. I was looking for signs of pedomorphism, and I, I almost fell on the floor, because at the National Park entrance, they say, guess what? This is the only species of primate we know in which the adult males will suckle from the adult females. So how much more pedomorphic can you get? <laughs> So the red colobus looks like just a fascinating case, and I suspect there are just going to be a ton of cases out there uh, for people to look at if they can find the right comparisons. And the comparison's got to be with the, the species that has lost its aggressiveness with some closely related species that is more aggressive. And island continent comparisons are probably going to be a, a great one. We don't yet know about the aggressiveness of those two species, but it's an obvious prediction about um, the mainland form being more aggressive. OK, so with the justification in hand, then, for the notion that there can be such a thing as a self-domestication um, dynamic that leads to a self-domestication syndrome, then you know, I love what Bob Franciscus and colleagues are doing, looking at humans and, uh, and thinking about the pattern that we see in humans compared to our 400,000-year um, uh, ancestor, whatever, um, as fitting into the domestication syndrome. So uh, we've, been, we've been through this. I don't think there's any need to, uh, to go over this again. Um, but let me draw attention to a sort of fascinating little puzzle that we get to when we think about reduced aggressiveness in humans. Because on the one hand, you've got something like this, uh, a typical comment from studying people in small-scale societies. Incredibly little aggression, 17 years, not a single scuffle among the Aceh men. OK, that's great, until you read about um, some other aspects. But uh, at that level, which is uh, reactive aggression, uh, if we compare just the rates of aggressiveness in hunter-gatherer society to chimpanzees, we get something around three orders of magnitude difference. It might be more, it might be less, but, but it's, it's, you know, it's a lot. It's huge. Chimpanzees, you regularly see being aggressive. Humans but don't often see each other being uh, involved in fights within groups. But at the same time, we all know that humans are a dastardly species full of appalling behavior, a tremendous amount of violence. So how do we square this? We have to separate out reactive aggression from proactive aggression. Reactive, the, the hot-blooded aggression, proactive, the cold-blooded, um, premeditated, uh, planned aggression that is so characteristic of what goes on uh, in uh, this context in which we, we kill people. OK, well now, what that means is that when I compare us to chimpanzees, I like to think of us as, um, on the one hand, being Rousseauian with regard to reactive aggression, and on the other hand, uh, being Hobbesian with regard to proactive aggression. So uh, do we follow uh, these icons, Rousseau or Hobbes, uh, either neither or both, depending on which you think? And so here's the little question I have in mind. How is it that selection simultaneously favors high tendency for proactive aggression, as bad as any other species, if you like, with 
a tremendously suppressed tendency for reactive aggression. Well, mechanistically, I think it's perfectly plausible. You know, we know enough about the brain to say it's reasonable to think that selection can act on these two separately because they are caused by different um, neural pathways in the brain. Closely related, but separable. Okay, so uh, then we go to think about uh, craniofacial feminization following Bob Francisco's talk, um, starting um, uh, maybe 200,000, maybe, maybe earlier. So some people want to, to say uh, early in, in Homo. And I want to suggest a very specific, simple mechanism for thinking about how this happened in humans. And uh, it may be too simple, but it sort of gets us thinking about something. And it's based on, on observations like this, which is among these wonderfully peaceful people, the harmless people, as Elizabeth Marshall Thomas called them, the Kung San of, um, of Southwest Africa. And here, here we see a, a Tui had killed three other people when the community, in a rare move of unanimity, ambushed and fatally wounded him in full daylight. People, in a rare move of unanimity, they talked about it, they said, that guy, he's killed three people, he just can't be trusted. We just need to get rid of him. Let's do it. And they had a form of capital punishment. Capital punishment was discovered about 20 years ago to be a human universal. It occurs in hunters and gatherers in all continents. It's um, uh, possible uh, because humans are able to, to use language to uh, discuss with each other that uh, there is a troublemaker in the community. And if one looks at the ethnographies, it appears as though it is uh, aggressive males that are the principal victims of capital punishment. So it's a mechanism of social control. We don't know how often it really happened because as soon as the government gets involved, uh, then people hide whether it's happening at all, and they're certainly not open about it. But the thought here is that this is an essential part of uh, the egalitarianism of small-scale society, the phenomenon of counter-dominance, as a result of language, uh, the society can get together, execute aggressors, and so you've got the execution being carried out by people who are skilled in proactive aggression. At the same time, what they're doing is getting rid of a reactive aggressor. So that's the idea that counter-dominance is leading to selection against reactive aggression, and that this, in the kind of way that we've been hearing about in the other talks, leads to all these unselected effects. So, uh, both, well, reduced aggressive anatomy, uh, as uh, Bob was saying, but then uh, pedomorphic cranial growth and uh, reduced cranial size and, uh, and maybe homosexuality and some other play and learning and so on. So that's the idea. Bonobos, red carnivores, humans, many other species yet to be recognized, diverse selection pressures leading to reduced reactive aggression and self-domestication syndrome. And in particular in humans, capital punishment, allowing it to happen. Now, you know, that may be a bit exaggerated, but it is a mechanism. And uh, I think I skipped us, uh, to note that very high rates have been seen in, in New Guinea, uh, more than 15% of men dying uh, from being executed by capital punishment. And the essence of this is that language-based cooperation would have made it possible, because that's what you need to be able to effectively form a conspiracy. It would lead, as Bob says, to tolerance and cooperation, behavioral modernity, and so on. And then the tolerance would uh, somehow uh, favor again the ability to uh, develop a really effective language. So uh, that's the idea that uh, ultimately language-based cooperation would be critical in developing the kind of dynamic that is ultimately responsible for human self-domestication. So um, thanks very much, and I'd like to draw uh, specific attention to, uh, to my, my colleagues, but also to Irvin Dvor, who'd have loved this uh, conference, but he died 10 days ago. Thank you very much. <laughs>